to go back back in time if you can remember when you first found out about the Jim Nance Award and um, getting your demo reel or the reel for it together and, and how you went about that process? Oh, gosh. I mean, the, the spring, it would have been spring of 2011, and uh, I had heard about this program. It was relatively new at the time. I think it was only in its third year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was thinking, all right, yeah, maybe I'll just kick the tires on it. Maybe I, Maybe I'll just submit an application. You never know, right? Um, and we had luckily had a really exciting hockey season at Northeastern. So I had a lot of really good material to work with because the games were so good. Um, but I, uh, I remember debating between, all right, should I just focus on play-by-play? -play? Should I put other things in there? Like, what's going to impress people? And uh, I kept coming back to, you know what, just focus on hockey because I don't know how many students – college students have the opportunity to do hockey play-by-play. -play. Uh, so, you know, we, we had an opportunity to call a game from TD Garden, the Beanpot Tournament, with 17,000 fans there. Like, it sounded like a professional broadcast, uh, not the least of which because the environment was so great. Uh, so we, you know, it was a, you know, the quality of the sound was pretty good. The quality of the call was pretty good because we had a decent game. Uh, I put one of our talk shows on there. I don't think that was all that impressive, but I, I really felt like my work in hockey could help um, kind of anchor my demo reel. And uh, you know, it was lucky the way that it all turned out. And uh, you know, I got a phone call about, uh, I guess it would have been like a month after the season ended from John Telesnik about the, the whole work. Cool. Um... And then did you realize that part of the deal for winning was coming to our awards weekend in Salisbury at the time? You know, the funny story with that was uh, when John called me, uh, at the time, I think they wanted it to be a surprise for when you arrived in North Carolina. Right. So he called me and said, hey, you know, you're one of the finalists for this award. We'd love you to come to this banquet. And uh, I was, I remember at the time I had uh, plans to go see family and uh, it was right kind of the next day after the awards ceremony would, would be. So I'm like, well, I kind of have this you know thing planned here. I don't know if I can make it. He was like, mm, you know what? I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm going to tell you anyway, you're the winner. Uh, so that <laughs> just spoiled the surprise a little bit. But even so, the whole weekend was just uh, incredible in, in Salisbury. I mean, such a historic venue. And, uh you know the the barbecue lunch at the train station. I mean, I'm I'm a wide-eyed junior in college coming into a world that I wasn't even expecting to be a part of. You know, I, I didn't think that I'd, I'd be making a career in sports broadcasting at the time. Um, but you know, getting to meet all these amazing people and you know, folks who are now peers in a way, uh, you know, I think back on it and just uh, I, I'm caught up in so many great memories from that first time down there. Uh, just shaking hands with, I don't know how many people who I had watched on TV for years and thinking, man, if I could be as good as that, that'd be pretty cool. Um, and, and did you have any clue before you went? I mean, what were your ideas of maybe what it was going to be before you got there? Oh, I had no idea. Um, you know, I, especially given the location, right? Because Salisbury is such a small town and, uh, the whole town came out to really embrace the whole awards weekend. So I went down there thinking, all right, it's, you know, take a place to some college and we'll have a dinner and then we'll have an awards. And I had no idea that everywhere you went, the town just embraced you. Um, it was the epitome of Southern hospitality, right? You know, all these local businesses that, you know, have their, have the red carpet out for, um, you know, these amazing, in, in many ways, celebrities, right. Who came down to uh, this banquet, um, you know, each step of the way, I was blown away. At, oh, you're here for the awards weekend. Oh, you know, what are you here for? Would you? Oh, you're that college student. That's amazing. So, I, I was blown away by the hospitality. It was awesome. And you, you you touched on it. You got to meet all these people who you had watched growing up, or maybe read or listened to. Who who are some of the people that you got to actually talk to? One of whom is uh, you know now a guy who I, I look forward to seeing on the circuit all year long. It was Pete Weber. Uh, one of the first people I, I met and uh, you know, again a guy who I had heard of and, and looked up to his, 
his work because he's been such a mainstay in the NHL for so long. Uh, but, you know, we connected by email afterwards and it wasn't, it, it, you know, so, so often when you're young and you're thinking, okay, I got to meet somebody, right? And it's, it's an intimidating experience. And Pete is just such a warm person that, you know, that all of that melts away. And even to this day, you know, I, I look forward to, to see when the Predators come to L.A., of shaking hands with Pete and hearing a fun story about Notre Dame or something. Um, and he's been around a variety of different sports and had so many different experiences in his career that it's fun to, to hear his stories. But uh, to this day, I mean, one of, one of the coolest people uh, that I had a chance to meet at the awards weekend. And, and he, he, he knows or has known everybody who has played, as you said, however many that sports is. since the 60s. So Well, and, and Pete was one of the... Uh, one of the original broadcasters for the LA Kings as well. So we've been able to connect about that. Uh, he called games alongside Bob Miller in the early 1980s. So uh, you know, it, I've heard some stories from Pete about the Kings back then. And it's actually been really helpful for me in giving some historical context for the franchise's history. Other people you met, who maybe people who came up to you after the awards and people who maybe never in your wildest dreams you would think you would have even have had the chance to talk to who came up and approached yeah. you. And the whole weekend is is still very much a blur. Uh, a blur. Um, Ian Eagle was one. Um, uh, Joe Beninati from the Washington Capitals, another. Um, I mean, like, I'm I'm st I'm trying to think back. Like, there there were so many different hands that I was shaking. Dan Shulman was one of the award winners at the time. Um, it just, I, I was I was more in awe. And I, I think. <laughs> Anything else? I found it hard to strike up a conversation at the time because there, there was so much uh, in the in the kind of cocktail hour leading up to the awards itself. There was so much mingling going on. I'm just a fly on the wall, listening to conversations more than I am introducing myself to other people. Uh, and then there are other students uh, who I uh, was able to meet, uh, previous winners. I know Adam Cavalier from uh, Carson Newman, uh, who had won, I believe, the year prior. Uh, and you know, he and I have become friends over the years. Uh, you know, just other other people in my age bracket who I think were trying to you know, had the same experience then of of getting to meet these people and pick their brains about working in the industry. Uh, that's what sticks out to me just as much as getting to meet you know, professional broadcasters was as a, an undergrad using it as a, a learning experience. Right, I'm, I'm going to try to learn as much as I possibly can about this uh, while I'm in this environment. And, and it was actually that awards weekend that kind of spurred John to call me and say, what would you think of doing this uh, series of seminars mm -hmm. at some point during the awards weekend? I know you came back and took part in those, yes? Uh, I actually didn't. So I came back and I, I just, I took part in the awards weekend. Uh, I actually, you know, now that I'm, now that you bring it up, I, I you know, I would love to do one of those seminars again, if, if the schedule lined up, uh, like just uh, to, you know, especially, you uh, a younger guy, right? And I've had to navigate a couple different things. You know, I'd love to do one of those videos. Yeah, no, I, I actually played tennis that week. I was in the tennis tournament that week. <laughs> but what did that winning that award mean to you when you go, now go back for your last year? Job hunting is underway. Mm -hmm. uh, it changed my entire idea of what I wanted to do as a career because I didn't think that I'd have future in sports broadcasting. I just figured, ah, you know what? I'm not studying it. It's not for me. I'm not going to have a career out of it. And after winning the award, um, you know, suddenly I'm thrust into, uh, you know, a place where people are saying, oh man, you got such a bright future, you know, keep at it. And uh, I think my senior year dawned on me, you know, I have this, uh, you know, this, this platform, I guess, and this uh, item that I can uh, use in a job interview in sports say hey you know even if i didn't win the award i was nominated for this or i was you know part of the uh, you know the top 10 for this it, it was it was a huge boost in confidence to me to say maybe i could do this mm -hmm. now as you know i didn't wind up going full time into sports after graduating um because i was still thinking to myself yeah you know i kind of want to stay in boston i i love living there and i i found opportunities to be able to do um freelance work on nights and weekends um so this award actually, I think, interest the idea for me that I don't have to do it full time necessarily, A, to have fun, 
and B, to make it a career. I think that's that's one of the secrets of this industry is that there's so many people who work in sports broadcasting and it's a passion project for them. And it should be a passion project. It should be fun. It should be something that you're not waking up and thinking, man, I got to do this thing again. I got to go through this slog. And there are so many people who grind it out in minor league baseball and it is a job for them more than anything else. And I, I think, you know, sometimes that hope fades of being able to get to the next level. So I tell uh, you know, college students all the time that even if you can't do this full time, even if it's only a part time pursuit, even if it's just a passion project, you should pursue it uh, because in many ways you might enjoy it more if you're not thinking, where am I going to get my next gig to pay my rent? If, mm -hmm. if I have skill sets that I can earn a living in other ways uh, and be able to do this nights and weekends even, um, I would have been perfectly happy if my life consisted of fill-in work in the AHL and doing Northeastern basketball for a hundred bucks game. I would have been happy. I would have been thrilled. That would have been great. Um, and I'm just lucky that I got to you know, kind of continue my career in, in a different way. And so you did that for how many years before <laughs> fate smiled upon you? Yeah, I, I did that for a solid four years. I had, you know, full time, nine to five, uh, sometimes longer, and then uh, carved out time to be able to do broadcasting on a freelance basis. And I, I would be remiss without mentioning how, you know, folks at Price Waterhouse, where I got my first job out of college, were so flexible with allowing me to do this, right? They believed that by letting me pursue this passion, it made me a better employee. Um, so I, you know, on the nights where I was doing a game, I would schedule, you know, a half day's worth of vacation that day and then rush back, take the 6 a.m. flight, be in the office the next morning, you know, basically holding down two full-time jobs in the college sports season just so I could have the, uh, you know, the experience under my belt of, of being able to do sports broadcasting. And they knew that, yeah, if I continued to do this, uh, you know, for a longer period of time, they were going to lose me as an employee. But... I don't think it mattered to them uh, in that period of time. I think they just, they wanted me to be the best that I could be knowing that, Hey, if they believed in me that I could multitask and do both of these things that I'd be a good employee for them. So uh, I owe them a debt of gratitude in many ways too. And so was it Northeastern basketball and AHL hockey that you were doing all this time? So uh, I wasn't, necessarily doing just Northeastern basketball. I did AHL hockey fill in for three years um, under Brendan Burke. He hired me to fill in for him when he was doing college football on the weekends. Uh, his big break in TV allowed me to get my big break in hockey because I didn't have pro hockey on my resume before. Um, so he brought me in on Friday and Saturday nights while he was calling Conference USA and Big 12 football. Uh, and I could call AHL games and I did for three years. Even even though it wasn't you know full season under my belt, it was still unbelievable experience that then allowed me to then build on that and pick up some TV work doing hockey in New England with Nesson. I think the biggest takeaway for me and how, how my career is just you know, it kind of exploded in a short period of time was you know each opportunity I tried to build on, I to you know climb to the next spot, right? You know I, I would take this pro hockey experience and say, hey. Okay, can I do TV hockey? Uh, and I was lucky enough that somebody believed in me to do it. So, I, you know, I've been incredibly fortunate that, that people have believed in me each step of the way, even in, in some respects when I wasn't fully ready. Um, so, the King's job, how, tell everyone how that came about. <laughs> so, the King's job uh, was a job I, I initially thought of applying to in January of 2017. Uh, I saw that Bob Miller was retiring on the position and at the time i was doing a fair amount of hockey um you know i had a bunch of college hockey on my resume i had ahl hockey on my resume and i started to uh, work at nbc doing college hockey for them so about the time that i had put out feelers to fox sports uh, to kind of get a foot in the door for applying for this job i didn't i never contacted the team directly um about the same time, I was put on an NHL game from NBC Sports, basically as a live audition of sorts, because they liked my college hockey work. Um, so this was March of 2017. And as I'm applying for this job, I'm calling an NHL game. 
And I knew then and there, and this was Tampa versus Chicago in March of 2017, I knew this game was my audition for the NHL. Um, so not only am I super nervous just because this is the biggest game, biggest stage I've ever worked on, I know then and there that if I nail this, I got a pretty good a pretty good uh, likelihood of being a finalist for the Kings job. And it winds up being this incredible comeback win for Tampa Bay uh, that I knew then and there. I like the overtime took place. Tampa wins it dramatic fashion. I knew then and there, this is my take. I, I, this is my call. I nailed it. This is my take. And the greatest feeling in the world, because so many times you come away from a game thinking, well, that was an okay call. Or, eh, or that, that was eh. this. I knew then and there. I nailed it right then and there. It was the best feeling in the world. So I had uh, planned on being in Los Angeles uh, a couple weeks later uh, just to work a gig at the Tennis Channel. And uh, at the time, I had a chance to schedule a meeting with the people at Fox and say, this is my work, right? Um, and that was, I guess, the, you know, the catalyst I needed to, uh, to get a, a leg up in the, in the job hunt there. So about a, a couple weeks later, um, I got a call saying, hey, you're a finalist for the job. and We want you to come in and do an interview and do a live audition. So this is May 2017. And uh, when they say come in for an interview, they bring me in to the, the boardroom at the King's offices. And there are 12 people around this gigantic table, all the department heads from ticketing to community relations to hockey operations, like all these people around this one table. And they're firing questions at me from every single angle. Like, why do you want to be a broadcaster? You know, where are you from? What's your background? You know, what can you bring to the table? Why are you different? Uh, and that was a bit of a harrowing experience. I bet. But I was completely put at ease right after that when the next meeting I had was with Luke Robitaille, the president of the team. Mm -hmm. I'm going into the meeting pretty intimidated because I'm about to meet a hockey hall of famer. <laughs> and Luke being Luke completely sets me at ease. Um, and uh, you know his personality is so disarming. Uh, you know Now he's my boss and he's like the coolest boss on the planet. Uh, but I'm going into this meeting super nervous and uh, he completely made it a, an easy conversation. So from there, I go into the live audition. And this is where it started to dawn on me that I had a pretty good shot at this. Jim Fox mm -hmm. was calling the Western Conference final for NHL radio at the time. He was doing games one through six. The series had just ended, so he was coming back to L.A. So all the while, he wouldn't have had a chance to audition with somebody else. So I'm, I'm starting to think, wait a minute, he's coming in to audition with me. So I'm either the first or the only person they're bringing in to audition for this job. Mm -hmm. We go into the studio. I've, you know, I've got my notes prepared just as if it's a live game. It's on tape from earlier in the year. And we, we hit it off right away. Instant chemistry. Uh, and I came away from the audition even thinking, yeah, that was pretty good. You know, it, it's, I, I, each step of the way, I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, this is, I have a shot at this. Mm -hmm. But it really uh, hit home um, <laughs> that I was their only guy they brought in for an interview when I had uh, dinner that night with the uh, GM at Fox Sports West, uh, the COO of the LA Kings, and uh, a couple of other dignitaries that I knew were pretty high up the food chain. And we went out to Fleming Steakhouse in downtown LA, and they're like, okay, this is a pretty intense dinner here if... If this is just a dinner because I came in for an interview, something else is going on. And it was only a handful of days later that they called me up and said, you got the job. Wow. That's awesome. And you were how old at the time? Uh, 27 at the time, because I'm wow. 31 now. Wow. It's amazing how that happens. Um, and so you had a couple months to get ready for camp. Yeah, um, it, was, it was a quick process. I was living in Connecticut at the time, and uh, I, they wanted me out there as soon as possible. So I, I took an apartment sight unseen because um, I had no idea. They, it, in hindsight, I probably could have come out here and, and looked at apartments and kind of figured it out, but took an apartment sight unseen. Just I wanted to get there, right? I wanted to hit the ground running. Uh, packed up everything I possibly could shove into my 2016 Honda Civic and uh, me and my dad drove cross country 
in Los Angeles uh, to, to move me in. It was almost like moving back into a college dorm again with all the stuff packed in my car. Uh, a lot longer drive, though. Yeah, yeah, a little bit longer. Uh, but it, it was so much fun, and I, I'm, I'm glad that I did it that way uh, instead of, you know, trying to do it, just, you know, pack all these boxes and you know, take a flight and have everything arrive. It was, it was such a great experience, a great time to spend with my dad. Uh, driving cross country and it's an experience i want to do again at some point um just because there was so much that we didn't get a chance to do we had a we had a time frame we wanted to get there in seven days we, we still wanted to do it at a, a relaxed pace but we still needed to get there in about seven days right um do you remember your first game yeah i wanted to throw up <laughs> <laughs> so i did a couple preseason games and they went fine uh, uh, and they were at home and you know everything's lighthearted and there's no pressure it's the preseason so the first game of the season was on national TV. I didn't get a chance to do it. Uh, so I'm sitting in the, in the press box watching the game and you know, just trying to soak in the atmosphere of opening night. So the first broadcast we did locally was in San Jose, which is a, a kind of an awkward broadcasting position for the visiting crew. So already things are like, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous because I don't have the best vantage point and whatnot, but you know what? The NHL, you got to find a way. Um, <laughs> They came away from that game. It was a one-game uh, road trip. We, I do the game, and I'm nervous through the whole whole game. Uh, I don't even remember the call. I don't even remember if we won the game or not. It was just such a blur. So we're on the plane back from San Jose, and uh, Jim can see that I am not in a good state, and uh, and he says, "All right, let's grab a beer." So we go to his local dive, and he gives me the best piece of advice that still sticks with me today. It is never as bad as you think it is. It's never as good as you think it is, and it's also never as bad as you think it is. And, and that sticks with me today. I'm just, you know, it's, it's a long season. It's 82 games. Um, you know, people believed in me for a reason. Um, they know that I'm in this for the long haul. And uh, just stick with it. And, you know, that whole season, every game, okay, this is getting better and better, and you're more comfortable. You're seeing each venue for the first time, and I keep going back to that. Anytime I think I have a bad call, it is never as bad as you think it is. Um, and so now with, what, two and a half years under your belt? Yeah, roughly. Uh, we're basically closing in on, on three complete years here in Los Angeles. If July we, 1 will be uh, my, my third full year. If we ever complete it. Um, yeah. How much fun are you having? Uh, <laughs> I have to pinch myself. I, it's still a dream job uh, to be able to work in the NHL. I mean, we, we go to great cities. We have an awesome sport. We have tremendous people. Um, and, you know, the, the, the other things that, you know, may seem you know challenging at the time, because at the end of the day, it's, it's still a job. You still have to work at it, and you still have challenges that you face and you have to overcome, um, you, you know, you still have to work with other people and, and sometimes you butt heads. It's just the nature of it, but it's so much fun. And it, and it really hits home this, this whole crisis here of just appreciate every single game, every single day we have working in this industry. Uh, the, the last game, was the last pro sporting event in the States, pretty much, um, you know, March 11th, I, I will remember that game for a long while. And just thinking about, uh, you know, what a privilege it is to, to work in this league, in this industry, uh, given that we, we have the, the privilege to do this. And I, I cannot wait to do the next game. Whenever that may be, I cannot wait. And it's going to be the most fun uh, I've had in my life. Um, people think maybe that you just show up and do games, but I know as a, as a broadcaster for a team, you have lots of other responsibilities. The preparation takes a lot of time for the broadcast, and I pride myself on on being prepared um, with not just stories on our team, but stories on the other team, which which sometimes rankles our fans because they don't want to hear as much about the other guys. But I think it's so important, um, you know, to to keep the audience informed and, and give the audience context. And I, I want to spend as much time as possible on, on preparation. But, but you're right, Dave, there are other responsibilities. I mean, I, I know on a regular basis, you know, once every couple of weeks, I'm asked, hey, can you give this 30-minute um, pregame pep talk to some of our sponsors who are here? Um, you know, they reserve a suite, and they, they'd love to hear from you. So, you know, I'll go talk to them about the game, the matchup, 
you know, give a little bit of inside access. I mean, it's those sort of things that, that, you know, help develop relationships with corporate partners over the years. Uh, and it's not just that. I mean, I, I think more important than the corporate side. And then, yes, the dollars are important for them. It's meeting fans one on one. And I love to meet fans and get to hear their stories and their experiences, especially if you're working for a team like I am, where I had familiarity with the LA Kings before working here, other than their two Stanley Cup championships. I love to hear about their favorite games. What was their favorite moment as a fan, which might be way before I arrived in Los Angeles. You know, it might be going back to Wayne Gretzky in the 93 Stanley Cup final. It might be going back to the Marcel Dion and the triple crown line in the early 80s, things that I never would have experienced. But I can see their joy in, in recounting those moments and try to bring the same kind of joy and enthusiasm when I'm describing plays with this new generation of Kings players that might lead to a championship. And this lays the foundation of you know people's favorite experiences at Staples Center. It, everybody who goes to a game for the first time instantly comes away impressed with hockey as a sport. So we're trying on a nightly basis to, to bring that same sort of enthusiasm to, if this was your first game on television, let's make it the best possible game and let's showcase the sport uh, in the best possible way each and every night. Here, you're not that far removed, obviously, from from your college days. What what advice do you give younger kids these days who are interested in in the business? I think the best piece of advice that I can give beyond um, you know having a variety of skills to bring to the table and having a varied education. Um, you know, maybe don't go the route that I did and study economics instead of communications if, if, if broadcasting is your passion or, or journalism for that matter. Um, but I, I think understanding that when you're in college, I, I get emails from college students sometimes like, hey, can you review my reel? And hey, you know, what do you think of this? And, you know, I'll give feedback and I try to keep it on a high level saying, you know, at the end of the day, get reps. Reps are so important. Yeah. Um, Self-evaluate. Um, don't worry just about what other people think of your work, but go back and watch it yourself and say, hey, do I like this sound? Do I think it fits with where I want to be? Um, develop a comfort with your own voice. And I know it took me a while, even as a professional, to develop a comfort level with my own voice. But I think if, if you have a mindset that you know, I have a personality when I'm talking to you, but maybe that can come through in a broadcast as well. I don't have to be tight and in an announcer voice the whole time. I can relax and have a conversation. I think the modern play-by-play -play guy is expected to be more conversational mm -hmm. than you know, a decade or two ago. So I think understanding you know, how you can bring out the best of your personality while maintaining that professional level is important. And I think one area that, that younger broadcasters struggle with so much because of the lack of reps is understanding your range. Everybody has a different voice. You don't have to have the, the silky smooth announcer voice. I think of a guy like Doc Emmerich, who, you know, when, when he gets up for a big moment, you know, he is yelling at the top of his lungs, right? But that's his style, right? And he knows his range and he knows that he can get up for that. Maybe some broadcasters can't get up to that range and, and don't necessarily have to try to meet Doc's level because that's his range, right? If you know uh, where you are from, you know, the mundane moment in a game to game seven, Stanley Cup final, if you can find that middle ground on a regular basis, uh, that to me, I think, is the mark of, of consistency in broadcasting, which is, I think, what we all aspire to do. We want accuracy, the old Vin Scully adage, right? We want accuracy, we want consistency on a, day, on a daily basis. Kids in college maybe don't get to do this, no matter how rep, how many reps they get. Maybe they do. Um, not always working with an expert as an analyst, but your job is also to make your analyst look good, to to feed him, you know, smoothly so he can come in and and make his point. Uh, how would how would you suggest that you know younger broadcasters do that? I think one of the ways that. Jim and I have developed chemistries with nonverbal communication sometimes. And it may be as simple as him giving me a nod. And I'll notice it out of the corner of my eye. I'm looking ahead at the action. Notice out of the corner of my eye, he's turning at me. 
and I'll, I'll know that, okay, when I can wrap this up, I'll, I'll get him in as soon as possible. Um, one of the things I've learned doing the shows with NBC Sports, when he's inside the glass, I don't have that ability to look down and see when he's ready. So I think preparing my call to get in and get out as soon as possible, and then if he's not there to fill the space, all right, then I can fill a little bit and maybe ask a question or maybe give a leading statement. Um, I think one of the lessons I learned early on, even uh, you know, working in college hockey, was don't try to do the analyst's job. It's okay if your analyst isn't giving you much. And it happens, especially at, at you know, lower levels of broadcasting, where an analyst is not going to be as polished, right? Uh, they, you know, they might just be there because you need a second person in the booth. Um, but I think, A, giving them space, and B, not trying to do their job, um, allows that chemistry to develop naturally. I think we fall into a trap sometimes when working with an analyst we're not familiar with or with an analyst that we're trying to extract something out of, of asking them questions or, or you know, uh, asking their name of, hey, Jim, what do you think about that play? Whereas I think if you could have a plan before the game of, hey, you know, I'm going to be pretty quick and getting in and out of these plays, so you'll know as soon as the whistle sounds, you can jump in. That's okay. Having that plan in advance is super helpful. Um, and then when you've worked with somebody once or twice, you have those conversations of, hey, you know, I was ready to kind of give a secondary call here to give a soft reset of where we're at. Uh, just so you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little bit of that space, but once I'm done, you're good to go. Those conversations are not easy sometimes. Right. And I think having them helps a ton with understanding space that you give one another but also understanding how to bring the best out of somebody. What does somebody like to have? I know Jim, for instance, he likes to call play-by-play -play of a fight, whereas most hockey announcers, they want to do it, right? Most play-by-play -play guys, they want to do it. But now I understand, oh, Jim wants to, to get in on this. So I'll get out. You know, we had that conversation, and it wasn't an easy conversation because I wanted to do it. But understanding, okay, this is something that I've done for years. I like to do it. Fine, you can have it. It's a, it's a good give and take between partners that way. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think that's the bottom line is there is a give and take. You know, play by play, you're describing the who, what, when, and where. The analyst is describing why and how. How, correct. Giving them the space to do that and having that conversation of what's the best way to bring out the best in one another, I think, uh, makes a good partnership. Awesome. So yeah, I think we talked about it a little bit before, but uh, and and I've brought it up with some of the other winners. Would love to have. I don't know if we want all nine at once, but maybe five one year and four another year come back yeah, and, and be do great. our sports media convergence summer. We've got to make a, a a cool panel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I appreciate yeah, your time. I'd love to do it. Yeah, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you much. Good luck getting back to it, and uh, most importantly, stay healthy. 